Welcome to the YK Law interview series where we talk about issues related to post-pandemic foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. Today we're going to be talking about the role of entrepreneurship in the recovery of the Latin American and Caribbean uh, economy post-pandemic. And we have with us today Dallin Vanterpool. Uh, Dallin is the author of uh, the recently re released book, No Boss, Only Clients, How to Build an Extraordinary Career and a Life of Freedom, uh, which book is available now on Amazon uh, and Amazon Kindle. Uh, Dallin Vanterpool is a financial educator and private banker uh, from the British Virgin Islands. Uh, he helps modern professionals connect their career moves to their wealth goals via his blog and the Careers Cash Flow podcast at dallinvanterpool.com. Uh, his focus is on helping others build extraordinary careers, master their personal finances, and, can, and create additional income streams so they can live a life of freedom. So let's jump in. Dallin, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Anthony, thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited to be here. And uh, congratulations on your new book. Appreciate I had a chance to read it in preparation for this talk. It was timely, inspirational, uh, and very informative. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book, uh, what was the influence and the motivation for writing the book, and where people can find a copy. Absolutely. So the book came out of a lot of my own frustration. Uh, this is from working over the years in corporate world, corporate America, corporate Latin America, corporate Caribbean, and seeing a lot of great talent, a lot of great people trying to figure out, one, how can they move from just being part of the line staff, part of just doing the job? How can they move from being an, an associate lawyer to being a partner? There seems to be, seems to be for me a gap, uh, an information gap or a knowledge gap or some kind of problem there where people couldn't figure out how to make that jump. So I took it on a, as a personal mission for myself just to figure out how do you do that. And to do that research, it ended up turning into the podcast, Careers and Cashflow, where whether it's reading books or interviewing successful professionals like yourself uh, from different countries, Silicon Valley, startup founders, a whole bunch of different people, trying to pick their brains to understand from them what is it that they did? What is it that they're doing to, to, to garner this amount of success? And then now I said, okay, we have this podcast, these podcasts out there with 200 plus episodes, which is all great information, but it's, you know, it's, it's scattered over a number of different places. How can we take the best of that and distill it down into one uh, cohesive product? And that was kind of the, the impetus for the book, No Boss, Only Clients. The book specifically, as we started developing it, the framework that the book is using is saying, look, instead of thinking of yourself of having a boss where this person's above you and you're doing work for them, let's reframe that conversation. Let's, let's adjust the power structure. Let's take it back and say, listen, this is not my boss, this is my client, right? And I'm, do I'm not working for somebody, I'm doing work for myself, right? But I'm doing work for somebody else. So the way of reframing the conversation instead of uh, having this kind of top-down mentality, you're not going to your job all day, like we talked about this in the pre-show, you're not going to your job all day, y you're going to do some work for your main client for the majority of the day. It seems like a subtle change, but I think that really starts to reframe the way people think about life and the way they think about what they're kind of do, trying to do. The second or the B side of the book, of course, I'm a banker. So the financial side of it comes into play where we're saying, look, uh, you don't have to only be an employee. You don't only have to have this one job. Right. You can go out and create additional streams of income to take the pressure off of uh, just trying to gain your financial freedom and your financial success through this one avenue. You can have multiple clients. You have your main client, and then you can also go through and do other things. So the book goes through techniques for how to build your actual career in your main client or your main job, so to speak. And then it takes a turn about 30, uh, for 30, the last 30% of the book talks about how you can actually systematically uh, build those additional income streams through different things. Okay. So you're an investment banker with experience in the U.S. Yeah. and in the Caribbean and other areas of the world, uh, but you grew up, born and raised in the British Virgin Islands. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up in the BVI and how that influenced uh, the thesis of your book? Yeah, absolutely. Growing up in the Caribbean, is, is for anyone who's watching this who happens to be from the Caribbean or spend a lot of time in the Caribbean, it is a different, it's a different feel, a different approach to things from possibly growing up in the U.S. For example, when I moved to the U.S. to go to school, went to Morehouse College, uh, when I moved there and having to, having to 
under work hard to understand the African American experience. Uh, where in the Caribbean now you, we're used to seeing you know black millionaires, we're used to seeing uh, dark skinned people in government. So you don't have this, you don't have so much of this complex of uh, one particular group is controlling the country and we we're just kind of takers, we're passive participants right. in it. So you kind of have a little bit more of a audacity about you, mm. the things. So that was a little bit of a shift in the Caribbean as well, though. Having said that, <laughs> you do have, I think, a little bit more of the, of the residual colonial uh, tinge to things that's still going on. You're still very aware that there is a class gap. There is a financial gap. Uh, you know, it's one thing to, for example, hear about the trans transatlantic slave trade. It's another thing to, on your way to school, you pass the dungeons every day where they were. So you, you have that kind of thing going on. But I think the positive side to it is that you see a very, a very live, you see very live examples of people who have become entrepreneurs, who have worked their way out of, uh, out of poverty. Mm -hmm. like if I look at my parents' generation and my parents, when they were growing up, you know, if they wanted milk, they milked a cow. Fast forward that 50 years later, you know, my, my dad runs a supermarket chain selling milk and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that was not just through luck, that was through a mindset that, okay, listen, nobody's probably coming to save us, we gotta figure this out for ourselves, and having to work their way through that. So you, you get to see that kind of thing where people are constantly thinking about not just what job can I get, but what business can I start? What's, what are the problems, right? And on the island, you don't have a lot of things. You don't have, sometimes you don't have a lot of things. For example, he started a supermarket chain because he saw a problem where there wasn't an resident, there wasn't ready access all the time to fresh fruits and vegetables. So problem, okay, I'm gonna start a business solving that problem by, by bringing a, a more constant stream of fresh fruits and vegetables in there. So that's a lot of the, the thinking that you see. What are the gaps? How can I fill that gap? What is the problem? How can I solve that problem? That's kind of the way uh, the Caribbean people think. And I think a lot of that spilled into my thinking with the book and the way I approach a lot of different things. Right. So do you feel like entrepreneurism uh, or entrepreneurship uh, is a cultural construct or do you feel that it is uh, a personal disposition uh, that anyone has based on your personality? If I can take a cheat answer here, I think it's a little bit of both and I would say that the cultural aspect of it informs or, 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 or programs a lot of the personality traits that you see. Yes. As we know, entrepreneurship, there is a certain amount of risk tolerance that you have to have uh, higher, ab above, and above and beyond what the typical person would, would want to do. Uh, but I, th I think, yes, the culture aspect of it, if you're around a culture where you see other people doing it all the time, and you say, oh, you know, they, they didn't die. They, you know, maybe that business didn't work out, but they bounced back and they did something else. So they went bankrupt now, and I see after a while that they were able to figure something else out. Then you start to condition your mind, or your, your, the culture is conditioning your mind, I should say, to say, well, I can probably get this done in, in with more a higher rate of success than someone who's in a culture where the goal or the, the thing that's praised is getting a great job, becoming a corporate executive at some big firm. Mm -hmm. You know, places like the Caribbean, you know, the, the person who's driving, uh, who has a fleet of trucks on the road and he's moving dirt, but he's making hundred thousand of dollars because he has a contract all over the place. That person gets almost just as much respect as the person on the street anyway, as the person who has you know, a high level corporate executive job. It's right. more about, as we say in the Caribbean, if it's making dollars, it's making sense. Right, right. <laughs> what is the propensity of entrepreneurship in the Latin American and Caribbean region uh, to propel growth yeah. in the uh, regional economy and to help get the economy uh, back on its footing yeah. uh, post COVID? So the question is whether, uh, you know, the uh, factors that affect uh, uh, the health of, uh, of entrepreneurship in a particular region mm -hmm. is structural or is it something uh, that's individual? If it's something that's individual, we may be able to affect those individual variables yeah. and um, focus, focus on that to propel the economy even though the institutional backdrop uh, might be uh, less quick to change, right? right? So. What I'd like to do with you today, take advantage of your personal knowledge, your, your, your professional experience, and talk about some of the individual variables that are studied uh, out there by experts uh, in the field of entrepreneurship, and uh, look at a couple of different countries in the region, 
benchmark it with the U.S. and see where uh, the numbers, the empirical results fall out on the, on the question of whether entrepreneurship is something that is more cultural or is more individual. Right. Uh, okay, so we're going to use some, some individual variables that are generated by the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Institute, the, G, the GEDI, which, uh, they, which gathers and provides entrepreneurship and business statistics on a country's entrepreneurial ec ecosystem through the Global Entrepreneurship Index, the GEI, which is an annual index that measures the health of entrepreneurship ecosystems in 137 countries. Okay. So the GEI uh, looks at the uh, entrepreneurial attitudes, aptitudes, abilities, aspirations of a local population, looking at uh, variables like opportunity recognition, skill perception, risk perception. Then it weighs that against institutional variables like uh, market agglomeration, right. depth of capital market, yeah. uh, tertiary education, uh, 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 like that. And it, so uh, right now what we're going to do is we're going to take six of the variables that the GEI studies, we're going to define them. Uh, I have the uh, results of these variables for the four countries that we're going to use, which is Jamaica, uh, Chile, uh, Panama, and the, the USA. So uh, just as a benchmark, uh, Chile was ranked 19th, the 19th most healthy entrepreneurship ecosystem mm -hmm. <laughs> out of the 137. Uh, the U.S. was number one, Panama was 70th, and Jamaica was 89th, okay? So um, let's just jump into these variables. So the first variable we're going to look at is uh, opportunity recognition. Yeah. So opportunity, GEI defines opportunity recognition as uh, the percentage of the population they can identify good opportunities to start a business in an area where they live, okay? Yeah. So on that variable, uh, Chile scored a 91%, uh, Jamaica scored an 80%, the USA scored 73%, and Panama s scored 68%. So let's remember that the USA was the top ranked uh, country in the index. It had the most healthy entrepreneurship ecosystem. Chile was... Uh, was 19th, uh, Jamaica was 80, was, Panama was, was 7th, and Jamaica was 89th. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about how those scores fall out? Uh, do you think it's a f re reflection of a cultural dynamic? Uh, or are these really just a proxy for, you know, the relative economic health of these countries? I think, well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, yes, it does have a lot to do with the relative economic health of the countries. But when you talk about the ability to recognize uh, a good business opportunity, I almost, I almost want to be in the researcher's room when they're doing that and step back and ask the question, what about the, how, how necessary it is, or the amount of burden, the amount of pressure it is on, there is on people to even want to identify or need to identify uh, a, a good business opportunity. If you take a place where if you take a place where you know, there's a lot of statistics out there available for jobs, either you can apply online, you can push a button and go to LinkedIn, and, and finding a regular job is more accessible, then, it, to me at least, it seems at least it's worth asking the question, for that kind of society that's more advanced and more developed, maybe in those kind of situations, it's, there isn't as much of a, of a push on people to say, man, I gotta figure something out, let me look around and see where there's a, business, a good business opportunity. Whereas in some places, Jamaica and some other countries, maybe there's a case where they're saying, look, I actually need to figure things out. And also, the, s the economy is not as complex. Mm -hmm. the, the business opportunities that someone might identify are more accessible, right? So it's not, okay, how can I build the next Facebook or how can I build the next billion dollar app? It's like, no, like my community doesn't have X, Y, Z. How can I mm -hmm. create that? Like I don't have, for example, a good friend of mine, uh, Nathan Wong, this is in the Caribbean and in the Virgin Islands, he realized that there was a there was a hole for uh, concrete construction. So we're talking about not just like buildings. If you want a concrete uh, countertop, if you want a, a concrete polished bathroom or whatever it is you want, he realized there was a gap for that, and he was able to say, okay, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to take some courses. I'm going to go online. I'm going to buy the concrete grinding machines. And I'm going to go out and start doing that on, a, on an individual basis. He started with small clients. That's a little bit different than someone saying, oh my gosh, I need. I need to find an angel investor to invest, you know, ten million dollars in my startup because I need to buy all this big. It's a different kind of scale, right. 
So I think the complexity of the economies and, and, and the nature of, of, of what people are doing societally, how connected they are to the communities, I think that plays a big part in there as well as to, one, as I said in the first place, how much of a push they have to do it yeah. and how accessible business opportunities seem. If it seems more accessible, I think people are more likely to say, oh, let me give that a try versus, oof, that I, I'll never be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. People in some countries, they're not trying to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. They're trying to make $10,000 a month. They're trying to make $100,000 a month, yeah. which is a different conversation than trying to figure out this magnificent business idea that's going to transform the world. Yeah. No, I'm trying to transform my street. And I think that point of view uh, jives well with the results empirically because the USA at 73% uh, with respect to opportunity recognition, uh, but it's the number one healthy uh, entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem, it makes sense. It's way more complex. Right. So it's, it's, it's more difficult for people to find those opportunities even yeah. though they're in an ecosystem that is advanced. Right. And, and you have things in the US, for example, the tax system and that kind of thing. It's 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 lean. It leans to favor the entrepreneur right. in terms of different things you can do to take advantage of different tax credits and different things. Uh, so there are incentives kind of built into the system to get people to be more entrepreneurial. If you know, for the for the for the for those who are willing to take advantage of it. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to the second one. Skill perception measures the percentage of the population who believe they have adequate startup skills. So this is a very individual self perception. Yeah. Um, the authors of the GEI reason as follows regarding the relative importance of experiential learning mm -hmm. and formal education in the uh, health of entrepreneurial uh, ecosystems. So I'm gonna read this from the, from the authors. Okay. Most people in developing countries think they have the skills needed to start a business, but their skills were usually acquired through workplace trial and error and relative, relatively simple business activities. In developed countries, business formation, operation, management, et cetera, require skills that are acquired through formal education and training. Hence, education, is, uh, especially post-secondary education, plays a vital role in teaching and developing entrepreneurial skills, right? So yeah. on this uh, a variable of skill perception, Jamaica scored 100%, <laughs> Chile scored 83, US 67, Panama came in last at 63, okay? So um, what I would like first to ask you is, do you agree with the authors about this relative importance of formal education as compared to experiential learning? First of all, the, the, the results just kind of make me chuckle a little bit with the, uh, as you said, it's a very personal, it's a very personal metric. Uh, the perception of whether, it's not about reality here, this is whether you feel right. like you got the juice. Right. right? <laughs> uh, very not, subjective. Very, very subjective. And I, I'll, I'll, I have a lot of Jamaican friends. So I'm not going to make too many comments about their, uh, their extremely high confidence, <laughs> lest they see this interview. Uh, but I, I think the confidence side of it does play into this a lot, because obviously entrepreneurship, as you know, there's a, it's, it's a, it's a high-risk move. Uh, yeah. Whether you're just going to start your own business from, from scratch, or if like, we're talking about in the book, you're thinking about starting something in addition to your main career, or you're thinking about leaving your career, that does take a lot of, of confidence, and it comes from uh, whether you think in your head that you, you can do what you have to do. Uh, the, the part about former education versus the on-the-job or the, the practical experience side of it, I think that's an interesting one to, to consider. Uh, when you do, and this is someone who's gone through, I think, a little bit of, a little bit of both. I've been in both worlds. So my dad, he built the business, and then he started doing the formal education. So I would say, I mean, he started doing the, I think he did more of the formal education just to prove a point at the end uh, later on in life. Uh, by this time, it's already a multi-million dollar business built off of practical experience. I mean, he, he, the way he figured it out, he got a job being a driver for a guy that was a millionaire. So I'm driving this guy around, I'm asking him questions, I'm driving and I'm talking, I'm driving and I'm talking, and you learn how to do things. Or you get a job uh, doing things for other people, working in certain things, but you don't take that passive approach of just being an employee. You look at work as a research project, right? right? And you're taking notes. Okay, so that's how, okay, all right, so this didn't work, let me, let me take, take a note of that. So when I go do my own thing, I try to figure it out. I think the thing about formal education and part of the danger with it, depending on how it's approached, is that it can really, it can really trick you or condition you into thinking that the only way you can apply the skills you're learning is to apply them within the construct of a company that isn't yours, within the construct of something that's already built. Whereas on the practical side of things, when you're saying, okay, I'm gonna learn from, uh, from how I, I did it at this business, I'm getting that work experience, that I think can build up a lot more of your confidence because if it's it's one thing to be 
in the office designing the sales plan. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be on the ground doing sales yeah. because you don't have a choice because you're the salesman, you're the accountant, you're the, you're the everything. Right. Uh, and knowing how to deal with that rejection face to face and, and then having, to be, having the successes of being able to overcome that and still make your goals happen, I think that can build up a lot more confidence than just having a theoretical formal education, the understanding the metrics and the turnover rates, and th that stuff is very necessary. Yeah. But someone who can say, yeah, I hear your theory, but I know what it feels like mm -hmm. to go out and do the work and come home with this cash in my hand. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not wait a month for the metrics coming from the 10Q, <laughs> in the 10Q report and figure out what goes on. So I think that might play into some of those, those numbers that you see there, places like Jamaica and other places in developing countries where people, you know, they've done the work or they're doing the work so they feel yeah. very confident that, yeah, I, I can do this. Yeah, I mean, I think the authors of, of the GEI sell short the ability to extrapolate from experiential learning to something more complex because, right. like you say, you have the experience of actually pulling the trigger in a real-world yeah. uh, entrepreneurial environment. Uh, which takes a little bit of, you know, uh, intestinal fortitude and yeah. confidence that someone who is steeped in theory may not be able to, to do. But it's important, I think, this variable because if what we need is formal education to propel entrepreneurship in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, that might not happen quickly enough for us, yeah. right? We need to get out of this depression that we're in post-COVID. So um, we need to embrace experiential learning uh, more yeah. so than, uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a combination of the experience you're learning, but I also think, as you said, time is of the essence here. We're coming out of a pandemic, or trying to come out of a pandemic depression situation. So I think the form of education as we know it, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, the people who want to become entrepreneurs, yes, the, the, your, your feeling about being 100% confident is great, but there are certain skills and certain things that formal education does teach you that can help you run a business. So I think it's going to be a situation where we're going to have to have a hybrid version, like targeted formal education. Like everybody doesn't, everybody's not gonna have time to do a full four year liberal arts degree where they're learning philosophy and they're learning algebra because they wanna run a business. Yeah. Uh, and this is not knocking those kind of things. I mean, I went through, I, I see the value, but I think a lot of people are not gonna have the, the time and they're not gonna have the money to go through that stuff. So I think we're gonna have to think about learning specific skills. Okay, you need to take a four month course on this specific skill because this directly translates into what you're trying to do for business. Yeah. I think it's gonna be a lot of that kind of stuff. Not throwing out the formal education altogether, but I think the pro entrepreneurs who are gonna win are gonna focus on what skills specifically do I need to get this goal accomplished? Let me go out and get formally educated in that while doing the actual work. Mm -hmm.